register under this act. We acknowledge your kind presence and we are deeply grateful to you for becoming a part of this lecture. My name is Samuel Nkum Tinkrai. I'm a registered pharmacist. I'm a pensioner or a pensioner. Some say pensioner, some say pensioner. I don't know which is right, but uh, I think you understand. Yes, I'm also a freelance management consultant and very, very interested and participate in the mentorship and le leadership uh, programs. A little bit about the amalgam of professional bodies, and for that matter, this um, organizing committee, which has taken the initiative to organize public lectures um, for a purpose. The purpose will come up. We are sourced from various uh, professions, from multiple disciplines. And I must say that we are very, very inspired people. And we are very interested and are committed to leading a course to get or to, 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 to ensure that leadership in uh, this country uh, takes some different direction for the better and for the good of all of us. I want to, you know, get you to, vision, uh, uh, to visualize the image of pain or affliction as a deeply embedded thorn that requires tenderness, compassion, and skill to remove. The image of pain as a deeply embedded thorn that requires tenderness and compassion for that matter and skill to remove. Ladies and gentlemen, a thorn has entered your foot. Those of us who have uh, lived in the villages, we know how it is. And so, I will name now into me and Nancy. A thorn has entered your foot. That is why you weep at times at night. This is the imagery that um, Siena, um, Catherine of Siena in the 14th century wrote or painted. And she continued, there are some in this world who can pull this thorn out. And the skill that it takes to pull it out, they have learned from God. Catherine devoted her life to cultivating that skill and is still remembered. Catherine is still remembered today for her remarkable capacity for empathy and compassion for others in their pain. I believe every one of us here wants to be remembered after our death. But we also know that posterity only remembers and honors the memory of those who cultivated a life of loving service and community of healing. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the story of Ghana. A thorn has entered her foot and she weeps, not at times at night, she weeps always. We, professionals of this country, have learned the skills 
Ghana has been generous with us. We have benefited from the largesse of this country. We have the skills to pull out the ton. Are we willing to save Ghana? Rhetorical, rhetorical question. Ladies and gentlemen, in principle and practice, professional bodies are dedicated to the advancement of the knowledge and practice of professions through developing, supporting, regulating, and promoting professional standards for technical and ethical competence. They are concerned with the public benefit as well as the reputation of professionals. We of the Amalgam believe that a better Ghana is possible, but that it must be achieved through creativity, hard work, and integrity. We believe that leadership in traditional Ghanaian society is inclusive and consensual, and that this time-tested approach to governance ought to be reflected in our national politics as well. We believe that mindsets are a major driver in all development efforts. Indeed, that mindsets and thinking are the primary productive force. Democracy requires public reasoning and engagement, and the amalgam exists to contribute to this process and to ensure that professionals participate actively in the process. All this, ladies and gentlemen, is aimed at securing the long-term health of society by improving the livelihoods of our citizens. We believe all people, we believe all people must have access to shared dignity and shared prosperity. We are therefore gathered here this evening with the purpose to engage and influence thought and actions concerning matters of national leadership and governance. And governance that will assure us the growth and prosperity that we all yearn for ourselves, our children, our youth, and posterity. The topic for this evening's uh, lecture is a common manifesto for our common future. And we promise you an exciting evening. On behalf of the organizing committee, I once again welcome you and appreciate, deeply appreciate your presence. We are truly honored to have you. Now, my next duty is to introduce the chairman for this evening's lecture. He is a graduate of the London School of Economics holding an MSc in Media and Communications, and is a Ford Foundation scholar. He earned a first-class Bachelor of Arts degree from the Ghana Institute of Journalism. He has received numerous professional awards and recognitions, including recognition from the CNN African Journalist Awards and the Best Reporter Award from the Ghana Journalist Association. He is currently the senior news editor of Joy News, part of the multimedia group, and the head of the political desk. He anchors the prime time television current affairs program, PM Express, as well as the prime time radio news analysis program, News Night, and the daily news show, Top Story. For five years, he served as a Ghana correspondent for the United Nations Humanitarian uh, News Agency. Ladies and gentlemen, with a huge applause, please let us welcome Mr. Evans Mensa to take the podium and chair this evening's function. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Evans, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Welcome. I'm right behind you. Yes. Thank you uh, very much. Your audience. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
Yes. A big round of applause for Samuel Lekum. Lekum, thank you very much. And many of you are watching us tonight from wherever you are. Thank you very much for joining us. We are live on the Joy News channel. We are live across our many social media platforms also. And before I start, I have a few uh, interesting uh, friends of mine who are in the audience that I want to acknowledge. I, I see a good friend of mine. He's a former uh, Auditor General, Dana Demolevo. Thank you very much for joining us. Yes. Uh, also also uh, here, seated right beside him, is uh, the Deputy General Secretary of the NDC, is Mustafa Gbande. Mustafa, thank you very much for coming. And to all of you who have decided to join us, we are grateful uh, that you can join us. So yes, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. I have been looking forward to this day with great trepidation and a fair bit of excitement as well. And as you know, in a part of the world when they call you chairman, it is a big title. You know, you're not merely the guide, but also the compass by which the journey takes its bearing. So I accept the challenge. Um, normally, I'll just describe myself as a moderator, but I'm a chairman. Why not? Let me enjoy the title for a while. I mean, who knows? I might become a chairman for real. But tonight I am, and I intend to exercise my full powers as a chairman. So we are now a year away from another major election. The political parties, as you may have noticed, are busy crafting their manifestos and the uh, policy proposals and messages are already out there. We are beginning to enjoy them already. I have a feeling we've started a bit early, but it's just the nature of our politics. But I recall distinctly in 2000, 2020, the last elections, we started using new, this new political uh, program called the Manifesto Tracker. And it was designed to not only scrutinize the manifestos, but as the name suggests, track the promises the parties make, their feasibility, and how promises tend to be repeated uh, from one election to the other. Even when the parties get the chance to govern, they get a chance to govern, and they don't actually do the thing that they promised that they would do. But guess what? The overwhelming majority of the promises never get fulfilled. But yet, in the next election cycles, as you may have noticed, they will be rehashed, I'm talking about the promises, and presented to citizens in shiny new covers. And have you bought any of the manifestos? Not bought, I mean, have you had seen one before? They look very shiny. They put a lot of work into the artwork behind it. Very beautiful. But if you get into the content, you're beginning to realize that, but why does this promise sound very familiar? It sounds familiar because chances are you've heard it before. One thing above all else stood out for me whilst we, we did that program, the sheer number of promises thrown around in the manifesto. So I'll give you an example. In 2016, in the MPP manifesto, we counted 510 promises in 2015 alone. In 2016, the 2016 elections, 510 promises. And then if you come to the NDC, they had 666 promises that same year in their manifesto. That, so that's a lot of promises. Come to 2020, for the NDC manifesto, we counted 617 promises that were made. I mean, how do you fulfill all this in four years. Uh, in, in, but if you see the manifestos, they're not that bulky document. So you immediately begin to see why, how they are lacking in detail. And thankfully, I'll be introducing the man shortly who would help us make greater sense of this. Now, the share quantity of these promises is, is of course, mind-boggling. It is as if the two main parties are competing on who can make the most promises, not who can deliver the best outcomes. Now, so how do we evolve these documents into fundamental transformational blueprints for our common future based on our shared aspiration? And it's a, it's a very important question that the uh, professionals in the Yamagam have been pondering over and, and hence the conversation tonight. We have just a month to help answer this simple but very complex question and you learn about that very shortly. He is the founder and senior partner of AB and David Africa, a Pan-Africa business law firm with independent offices in Ghana, in Zambia, Uganda, in Zimbabwe, in Kenya, and a network of firms uh, in 30 African countries. And a lot, it, we rattled over my tongue because it shows 
how he's extended his reach beyond Ghana. He's a, a proper multinational lawyer. Now, his, his experience cuts across almost three decades of lead advisory roles in multidisciplinary projects. He has been described as, quote, exceptionally strong in ensuring that client requirements are delivered. He always brings innovation to issues due to his wide experience internationally. And this, by the way, is according to the Chamber's Global 2020. Now, he is genuinely, genuinely passionate. And you would feel that passion when he comes up here to speak right after me about Pan-Africa business and policy matters. And his insights are sought after by those navigating Africa's business terrain. He is also an executive of the Africa Champions Organization, which has spearheaded several Pan-African private sector initiatives, including the private sector trillion dollar Africa investment framework for this continent, uh, which was adopted by the heads of state of the Africa Union of its, uh, at its summit uh, in February 2020. He co-led the Africa Champions team as well, uh, that mobilized private sector action for 28 uh, African countries for private sector action ahead of the start of the AFCFTA. He also recently led a study commissioned by a major development finance institution on, on how to pilot legislation that will promote the emergence and expansion of export trading companies in eight African countries, including Egypt, Tanzania, Morocco, Ghana, of course, Cote d'Ivoire, amongst them. He has served on governing council of the Association of Ghana Industries. Now, between 2013 and 2014, he had the distinction to serve as a, as a committee member of the National Competitiveness Council of Nigeria as a non-Nigerian member. Now, in addition, he also holds a master's degrees in public administration, and in applied business research. He's known for his free thinking style, and for me that's my, favorite, favorite, my, my personal favorite because uh, we are gonna be enjoying a bit of that. Uh, the freestyle in his thinking abilities will be on display. Frequently tweets his views on matters of public interest, and if I had a paper, I'll dedicate a front page section just to wait for his tweet so I can create a news headline from it, and trust me, I know it will sell. Ladies and gentlemen, please, with a resounding round of applause, help me welcome David Ofosu Dotti. And David is the is a senior partner at AB and David Africa. A bigger round for please, a bigger round of applause, please. I cannot find what I do. Thank you, Evans, for that uh, nice introduction. Just for the organizers, uh, I'm known for drinking water as I speak, so if I can have the water here, I looked around, I didn't find it. Oh, I think there is one here. Let me just grab it so that it saves the time. I don't know where Evans got all those wonderful things from. I was invited by the amalgam of professional uh, bodies to join them in their uh, attempt to actually promote contribution to national issues a few months ago, and I think the first lecture was delivered by Yao. And I've had the privilege of being invited to do the third in the series of lectures. And when I was invited, I chose to speak on this topic, a common manifesto for our common future. So with the topic I chose myself, it was not imposed on me. I think that as a nation, we've come to the point where we ought to be discussing things in common because it appears there are not many things that we unite around. We are divided, I mean, almost on everything. And I therefore thank the uh, uh, organizers for the invitation. Why did I accept it? I believe there are cynics everywhere, including in this room, who believe that Ghana cannot make it. And they are justified to some extent in their uh, view when they take a look at what has happened to this country over the years. So I do not begrudge their conclusion. But there are those who also believe that this country can transform, provided we all contribute our 
uh, quota to the national agenda. And I belong to this second group. Incidentally, I happen to be a perpetual optimist. Notwithstanding my tweets and the controversies around them at times, I am perpetually optimistic about the future of this country and that of Africa as well. But I am not an empty optimist. Empty optimism is optimism which is backed by nothing at all. And I think a large majority of politicians are empty optimists. They make promises without any basis whatsoever as to how the promises will be delivered. One is sitting in front of me. Uh, I hope you are not an empty optimist. <laughs> and uh, when I have a lot of friends among politicians, I try to draw their attention to the need to back their promises with things that they can deliver to the extent that our optimism will be backed by reality. But I also do know that optimism, optimism is not enough. Doing something about it is much more important than be, merely being optimistic. So I tend to be a positive optimist and believe in doing something about what we believe. In other words, optimism requires facing challenges as it is. So if politicians contest for offices by promising, as, as Ivan was saying, 600 plus promises. By the way, I counted 700 uh, at a point. Uh, at some point, I'll be mentioning uh, that if you, you promise up to 700 uh, promises, it is important that non-politicians ensure that we can bring them to the point where they either streamline these promises or are able to live up to it. And it is from that point that I accepted to give this lecture. For me, it is to help focus on the fundamental issues that is often downplayed in the manifestos. The outcome I hope for is that there will be a call to action and that it is not going to be a talk shop, but following this, people will be discussing it in order to drive the attention of politicians to the issues that ought to be discussed. But let's deal first with some preliminary issues and questions to deal with. The first question, and being a lawyer, I want to go legalistic just for that point. I'm not legalistic generally. The first question I want to deal with is what is the context of a manifesto under the laws of Ghana. Now, the 1992 constitution, which guarantees freedom for people to participate in the activities of the uh, economy and the society, it does not make any prescriptions that are binding in terms of make manifestos binding. However, even though manifestos fall outside chapter six of the constitution, which has been uh, determined by the Supreme Court to be a uh, justiciable uh, to some extent, uh, and I want to keep it very simple. Manifestos by their nature are not in that category. And this is per case decided the New Patriotic uh, Party versus Attorney General. Uh, I want to cite 1993-1994 to Ghana Law Report, page 35. So the position taken by the courts in Ghana on the was the, the legal effect of a manifesto reflects, however, the general principle of justiciability of manifestos worldwide across a number of jurisdictions. So in other words, they are not documents that you can actually uh, bring an action against somebody on. Why then are they so popular? But I ask the next question, is manifesto a social contract? Now. The authorities on this have concluded that it is not a social contract and it's essentially promises which are non-binding which the party seeking power uh, hopes to be able to deliver. Again, you can read the likes of Agostino, uh, John Trasher, etc., etc. I don't want to go into uh, theories at this stage. In other words, political manifesto only outlines the aims and policy proposals of a political party that it seeks to communicate to people with a view that it will win the elections on that basis. That then led me to the next question. When the ruling party implements a political manifesto, is it reasonable for people to judge their performance by that manifesto? Since it's not a social contract and we cannot sue them on it, it appears to me the answer to that question is yes, because the parties rely so much on the manifesto and they call us to rely on it. It is therefore important in judging them to check every now and then whether they are implementing their own manifesto or not. 
even more importantly, it is important for us to contribute to what goes into that manifesto. Because they will be implementing it to the best of their ability. And therefore, we cannot leave it to them alone. Let me quote the often said, uh, a, 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 a repeat often said quote. The business of politics is too important to leave it to politicians alone. So those of, us, those of us who are not politicians have to constantly be contributing to what they do so that we can guide them. I ask the next question before I proceed. Does Parliament, the representative of the people, have a mandate over manifestos? Theoretically, yes. To the extent that their oversight function in Parliament covers it, i.e. if the manifestos find their way into government policies which are presented before Parliament on periodic basis. In other words, if a manifesto promise, for example, finds its way into a specific ministry, let's say the Ministry of Finance or the Ministry of Education, then indirectly Parliament will have oversight for, over it because it has come before Parliament. So the manifesto itself may not be what the parliamentary committee is overseeing, but the actions from the manifesto that results in a ministry. Now, I say so because if I take a look at the committees of parliament in Ghana, and the committees are structured into three. One is the standing committees, which are essentially committees which exist almost really nearly because the actions, that, the things that the committees deal with are things which always occur. And the select committees which mimic the structure of the government. So in other words, if the government created a ministry of communications, then there will be a select committee on communications. If the government decided to abolish the communication ministry, then there would not be a select committee on communications for that matter. And then there are ad hoc committees. One of them in Ghana's parliament used to be an ad hoc committee on poverty reduction strategy. One of the things that I have criticized several times. Why we want to reduce poverty, I don't understand. So far as I'm concerned, we should be creating wealth and eradicating poverty and not seeking to reduce it. But having said that, Parliament, so far as I'm concerned, and I've said this several times, has never had a committee on business and the economy. Why do I say that? Because the structure of our ministries has reduced it to a Ministry of Finance and not a Ministry of Economic Planning. So whereas we have had a committee of finance which monitors finance and expenditure, we have not had a committee in Parliament that coordinates economic policies because finance is different from economics. And I have made this point over and over. Neither have we have a, had a, a committee that looks at business except for a, pre, a brief period when we had a ministry responsible for the private sector and, and recently a ministry of business development, then you have committees which oversee them. If you compare that to the decisions that we are trying to copy, you will notice that they have committees that take care of these uh, uh, sectors of the economy. That's, which is my next question, the manifesto of a ruling party constitutes a collective national agenda for everyone. Remember that when parties go to election, one party wins, and whatever percentage it wins, the assumption is that it carries its people and is supposed to carry the rest of us. But then the duty of the opposition throughout is to undermine that government in power. So in practice, it appears to me that there is an absence of a collective national agenda. And in that absence, the ruling party's manifesto becomes a national agenda, even though a non-binding social, not a social contract, not bound by the constitution, and not binding whether they obey it or not, nor can we hold them as a justiciable document. That is the position of manifestos. And that is where the challenge begins. But what lessons can we learn from history from this? For me, the key thing about the manifesto so far is actually about the fact that they tend not to focus on what I consider very, very important things, and I will illustrate shortly. Secondly, it appears it doesn't learn anything from history. What are some of the painful parts of our history? I will mention only three examples. One is slavery. Ghana, as an example, has got 28 or so of the 56 castles and forts dotted around Africa. That means slavery from this country was very intensive to have those, so many of those castles here. What really happened in slavery? I mean, we can talk about it over and over. There were raids, 
But before they raise, some people sold others. In others, in other ways, royal, royals sold slaves initially until others came raiding. In other ways, we have always had a society which is disunited, which distinguishes royals from ordinary people. And therefore, we sold our strongest before our strongest were raided for 200 years. Then we divided tribe against the other. And then we signed a bond and became colonized for 153 years. That's another painful part of our history. So for 353 years, through our disunity and divisiveness, we were either slaves or colonies. Then we gained independence and subsequently we decided to adopt multi-party democracy. But multi-party democracy is like a knife. You can either use it to cook or use it to kill. We have used ours to divide ourselves further. And we are divided on every single issue. And when we fail, collectively, we find excuses and escapism. There are two key escapes that we take. One is the external shock escapism. Every single party, when it fails to deliver its own manifestos, even though it is non-binding, blames external shocks as the reason for its inability to deliver. Either there was rise in oil prices, or fall in commodity prices, or war somewhere, etc. The other one, which is very, very shocking to me, very popular among intellectuals, is what I call constitutional escapism, where we blame the constitution for the failure of politicians. I cannot understand for the life of me why intellectuals do that. The constitution cannot be responsible for the failure of intellectuals. Yes, I'm a lawyer, and I believe parts of the constitution ought to be amended. I had the privilege of delivering this year's constitutional day lecture uh, at UPSA, and I made a statement I will repeat, that no constitution or law is so strong and so tight as to prevent people intending to do bad from doing bad. And no law is so good as to prevent good intention people from doing the uh, good intention people uh, from doing what they want to do. In other words, people want to do bad things who go around the law. And people who want to do good things, notwithstanding how bad the law is, who do the good things. I've said elsewhere that so far as I'm concerned, cabinet consists of 19 people maximum. And therefore, we can manage this country with no more than 19 ministries and keep it at that. But we've gone around the law under every single government and we have reasons and we distinguish and, 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 and all those kind of things that, I mean, of course, we lawyers help them do that. So as a result of all that, you will see that none of the political parties have been able to fully deliver the promises of his own manifesto. So, for example, in 1996, a lot of noise was made about Vision 2020, which found its way into the manifesto, and by 2000, the foundation was supposed to be laid. Of course, by 2000, the first five years, the foundation was entertained. Then there was the golden age of business. Now, we went epic in the course of the golden age of business. Then there was the better Ghana agenda and Ghana beyond aid, during which we have gone to IMF during those periods. In all this, when politicians lose elections, they quickly organize their parties and try to find out why they lost the election. I'm here to see any political party which lost the election. And I've organized a meeting and published why it was unable to deliver its manifesto instead of why it lost the election. Halfway, they tend to abandon the manifesto as a result of external shocks. And the supporters and intellectuals then blame the constitution and we keep creating uh, uh, many, many uh, uh, committees and the rest with the view that if we reform the constitution, things will become better. I was young when the constitutional drafting committee was uh, 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 put together and when the constitutive assembly was set up. And some of us hoped that we were never going to see a day to day where we will be talking about amendment of the constitution and blaming it for the mistakes of politicians. So this escapism is one of the things that we need to be mindful of. For me, without good men, 
good mindset and good attitudes, a constitution is worthless. worthless. If a government decides, for example, to do the things that will put us into a situation where we have to be, be going, going into austerity, blaming the constitution is not the right answer to the problem. problem. The role of technocrats in a society like that is to constantly make recommendations and contribute to the national discussion so that they can draw attention of politicians to the center. I believe that there are two ways, a mathematical formula, to actually uh, draw attention as to what will happen if intellectuals do not make the contribution they are supposed to make. One is when contemporary events, which I call C, and leadership choices, which I call LC, and citizens' responses, which I call CR, will equal to the speed of prosperity. There's a formula here. The other is when you have contemporary excuses, and we have a lot of that, divided citizenry, and absence of focus strategy, which spells our economic doom. Let us now analyze what the leading manifestos of the leading political parties have done. Incidentally, if you take a look at the manifestos from 1992 to now, they essentially are spread on 12 points. The economy, trade and industry, education, health, energy and petroleum, natural resources, science, technology and innovation, security, sports, tourism, culture, chieftaincy and creative arts, foreign affairs, governance, corruption and accountability. These are the 12 main, some tweak change their names over the period, and therefore Evans was right in terms of regurgitating it over the period. But over these 12 have been 700 promises over the period, some of which repeated. The interesting thing is that none of these manifestos seem to focus on the soft points without which the manifestos cannot thrive. So for example, the manifestos make copious provisions for security. But what is security in an indisciplined society? If a society is indisciplined, there cannot be security. It doesn't matter how many plans you make. Now, if you talk about a situation where you want to drive the, drive the economy, it doesn't matter the provisions you make. If there is no national unity, one side will undermine the other. Now, in the midst of all this, there are a lot of similarities, strangely, among the, 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 the manifestos. And I chose to pick three of the manifestos. One is MPP's manifesto, the other one is NDC, and the third is what I called any other. The any other have been presented a lot on the TPP manifesto. Because of time, I'll just draw examples of the similarities on a few. In the MPP manifesto for 2020, and I've done this research from 2012, in fact, going back to 1992 but mainly from 2012 to now. If you take the, on the economy, inflation, interest rate, exchange rates to restore macroeconomic stability is the core provision in point one of the MPP manifesto. Now, if you go to the NDC manifesto, it makes similar provisions under what they call manage Ghana's public sector debt on page 26. While CPP talks about self-reliant national economy. Now, if you come to job creation, you will find that MPP makes the same provision under the economy, NDC makes the same provision under framework for industrial revitalization, support and transformation, and the Ghana Affairs Agenda, page 36. And at times, some of the words they use are almost the same. Trade and industry, MPP wants to establish agro-processing factories and industries, NDC wants to establish agro-processing industries in Lower Menya and Bono, pages 1.4, 45 and 6.9.3 respectively. Planting for food and jobs, one district, one factory. Then the other one says repositioning agriculture and agribusiness as the key drivers to the economic growth and development. Education, you find similar similarities. You have free SHS on a universal basis and absorb BEC, WAC exam as point 1.6, page 103, 104. And the NDC, improve free SHS and the previous said they put it in quotes by expanding to the prime areas and abolish double track system. So they both talk about free SHS. MPP talks about incorporate technology in teaching and learning of maths. NDC says incorporate technology into teaching and learning, including provision of free tablets. 
So, uh, free SHS, uh, there was to be followed by free tablets. Health. Established centers for cancer. Uh, this is MPP. Page 1.7, 135. No, uh, 1.1.7, page 135. Established centers for cancer and cover cost of NHIS breast cancer covered under the scheme and accepting drug is also covered under the scheme. 7.2.3 NDC, establish cancer and kidney trust fund to support patients. Energy and petroleum, similar. Natural resources, replant trees along the banks of major water bodies and their tributaries, NDC, reduce the rate of deforestation and degradation. Sports, develop youth development and sports centers in all regions and stadia without one. NDC, develop strategy framework for construction of stadia in all districts across the country for, to scout for talents. Promote youth entrepreneurship by creating NEIP channel across the country. The other one, establish a young entrepreneurship development to support young entrepreneurs with technical and financial startups, etc., etc. Tourism, forge a new formal collaboration between chiefs and governments to address national issues. Partner with traditional authorities to promote various festivals. Foreign affairs, establish framework to facilitate the return of Ghanaians in the diaspora, etc., etc. Deepen the relationship with the African diaspora, etc., etc. I'm going fast before of time. Take leadership in ECOWAS, play an active role in ECOWAS. Governance, uh, Daniel Domulovo will love this. Resource the Auditor General's Office. The other one, strengthen the Auditor General's office. <laughs> now, these are over 12 heads. The real problem, therefore, is not what the manifestos say. It is rather what the manifestos don't say. Because the manifestos, in my view, are silent on very, very important issues which form the real foundation. Either they are completely silent on it or do not address them adequately. Examples will include issues relating to IMF, whether you go to IMF or not, which you will find, for example, mentioned in section 61 at page 176 of the MPP manifesto, and mentioned similarly in the NDC manifesto. But the treatment of these are not very detailed. And you will find that when it comes to issues like the central bank, there is criticism from both sides. When it comes to infrastructure, there is praise by both sides of what they have done. In fact, they both promise to actually continue projects that they did when they left office. Not projects that others were doing when the others left office. So, in the midst of this, it appears the manifestos overlook very, very serious challenges. Since it is a contest of popularity, those in opposition must deliberately undermine the challenges, the, undermine the existing government, and vice versa. And in so doing, the opposition underrates the challenges it will face when it is in power and overrates its capacity. I want to repeat that. When in opposition, they overrate their capacity and underrate the challenge they will face when in government. Also, those in government must downplay the facts that the opposition outlines so that both of them forget that they have a common enemy. And that common enemy includes mass poverty and high debt situation of the nation. What is the manifesto contest of Ghana's current challenges for the 2024 election? Since independence, Ghana has experienced numerous economic challenges, almost without exception. Every government at any point in time, has had to explain its challenges, as I indicated, with external shocks. And we have always had to run to the IMF, and it is followed by austerity measures. Now, these external shocks come in different forms. At times, the sanctions from the West, like we experienced during the early days of the PNDC revolution before NDC, or a drop in cocoa prices, or gold prices, or general commodity prices of our exports, or global financial crisis, or COVID-19, or war in the Middle East, or in Ukraine, 
leading to a price edge of food impact challenges. The result of all this, without exception, is we end up at IMF. And when IMF introduces measures which result in austerity, and once things stabilize, we do the same thing and go back to IMF. So apart from Dr. Ngrumah's rejection of IMF, we have been to the first one, and then he rejected it. We've been to IMF 17 times. When I divided it by our number of years of independence, it came to 3.8, if my arithmetic was right. In other words, approximately every four years, we go to IMF on the average. In some instances where we have skipped, we have gone there between five to seven years. The strange thing is that if you look at every IMF program, it takes three years to exit the program. What it means is that by the time we are exiting, we are about to enter. That's what it actually means, mathematically. Now, why exactly do we go to IMF? There are several reasons, and three tend to be most popular. One is indiscipline, the other one is external shocks, and the other one is neocolonial manipulation. I don't want to, I mean, uh, 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 take on any of these points. Whatever it is, it is very clear that no political party has enjoyed going to IMF. It's very clear that when they go to IMF, they give excuses, and very often when they go to IMF, they become very unpopular. The problem is not with IMF. The problem is that if going to IMF can discipline you, why are you not disciplined so that you don't go to IMF in the first place? That's a critical question we should be asking. Now, failure to learn the lessons from the problems because we overlook them when we are making the promises is one reason why we do what we do and end up at IMF. I will have thought, and pardon my language, I will try to be as decent as possible, that for a country which has a number of proverbs relating to the number of times you can step on the private part of fools, we should have learned after 17 times. Obviously, we have not. The strange thing I find is that not a single manifesto from 1992 to date has had a chapter on how not to go to IMF. I find this a very fundamental omission. As I indicated, it is not what the manifestos say, but what they don't say. If it's such a perennial problem, why don't we have express chapter devoted to how to prevent ourselves from getting into that situation? It may not necessarily make a party popular, but if the party is well organized, it will be able to get out of the problem and still be able to deliver its promises. And that is one of the reasons, I mean, one of the things that is strange that we overlook. So that's just one example. So I will therefore proceed to look at approximately 30 issues, and I will do them quickly, that all manifestos ought to look at if we are to get out of our conundrum. This is important, Mr. Chairman, because we are 2024. And the thing about 2024 is that if we do not direct their minds to the, what will go into their manifesto, we will get to the situation where the promises are going to cross 700 this time because we stand at a junction, a juncture, where it is very important for us to either be able to overcome our challenges and each is trying to claim that they have the best uh, 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 solution to our problems. Learning from history, if journalists do not guide the way politicians present their manifesto or question them on central key issues, they cannot bring them to the middle. As for the 12 points of economy, etc., I've already talked about it. Now let me deal with the, 12, the, the 30, approximately 30 fundamental things, and I'll deal with them very quickly. The first one is mindsets. Individuals have mindsets. And an individual mindset comprises of how he or he interprets the circumstances around him. The nations have mindsets too. It is the collective approach to things and our collective thinking in everything we do, including how we react to things economically, socially, culturally, family-wise. So just as an individual cannot go beyond the point he can reach that he has envisaged in his mindset, so is no nation greater than the collective thinking of its citizens. The, 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 the where we can reach as a nation can only be represented by the collective mindsets of our society. 
and therefore transforming our mindset is very very important the need for mindset change cannot be downplayed and i'm not the first person to talk about the need for mindset change it's been talking talked about over and over but what is this mindset and why should it change there are several examples not believing in ourselves and looking up to quote and unquote the white man and devaluing our own initiatives in favor of that which comes from the west i know the star story of a very big Ghanaian industrialist who was looking for approval for a particular thing in one of the ministries and went over and over and over and was not getting attention until one day he called one white man who was working for him took him to one of the ministries and the secretary to the person in charge and this is a real story this is a very prominent Ghanaian citizen uh, the secretary said in to his boss mr so and so the nebroni number and that day he got approval the Obroni was actually working for this person i'm talking about but the minds of the secretary said that once told her that once he came with a white man the white person was the boss it's a national mindset and we need to deal with it worshiping our leaders and carrying our chiefs in palanquin and going to the yes i talk about it yeah if they are chiefs here apologies we we are not the first people to carry chiefs in palanquin there is nothing cultural about carrying chiefs in palanquin i noticed a Ghanaian chief has uh, is now using a carriage i th- i encourage that the french used to carry chiefs in palanquin until pascal the, the, i mean invented the carriage four people carry you on the shoulder does not make anything cultural now chiefs go to the presidency to announce the death of chiefs i would have thought the president to read it in the newspaper some years ago the president of the national union of ghana students passed and it was announced to the president at the castle too and i'm not talking about current president i'm just giving you an example of how our minds work because when somebody dies we must go and announce it to the person the president failure to point our leaders mistakes until they lose power failing to enforce the law resulting in discipline in many sectors confusing justice with vengeance after change of government using time and resources of our employers for private gains calling others too known when they call a speed a speed having a preference for foreign product over that of made in ghana allowing situations to completely deteriorate before attempting to find a solution politicizing every national issue without putting systems in place to check future recurrence seeking funding for every single national program from donors we once actually borrowed money to actually attempt to fight smuggling we what part of the money we borrowed covered buying dog kennels now that type of mindset ought to be addressed and it is important that in 2024 political parties address the question as how to change the mindset because you cannot promise transformation with the old mindset nobody ever transformed the society with the old mindset political parties must have programs on how to transform the national mindset i have many ideas also i can share on this time will not permit but i do believe they are taking notes the third issue has to do with national attitude we talk about it i did not see any political party manifesto address this important issue of national attitude what is this national attitude they come from different angles nobody has defined it but we know it when we see it ghana man time starting things not on time an example happened today we all know it we've caught up with the time anyway we plan but we don't implement we like we lack the should do spirit copying the bad things from abroad and leaving the good ones abusing public office example police beating victims of a demonstration instead of actually shepherding them high public officials obviously doing the wrong things just because they are in power lack of maintenance culture so we wait until things deteriorate completely traditional leaders highly placed interceding on behalf of public officials who have done the wrong thing treating customers and clients as if we are doing them a favor and authorities and regulators which have been put to promote private sector lording it over them and not rewarding innovation so for example somebody invites a fufu pounding machine at knust and it doesn't become news how do you stimulate economic growth when you don't reward innovation delaying payments for businesses that private sector make to the public sector not continuing projects that the previous government left these are all Ghanaian attitude 
issues. Again, I expect manifestos to address these fundamental issues because these are the soft issues which are the real pillars upon which the 12 points of economy can rest. The action points of this will involve having a national crusade on attitudes and the need for attitudes to change. There was a time that I think the vice president at that time launched a campaign on discipline. But it didn't go far. During the days of Kutu Achampon, there were similar campaigns also launched. But if all political parties have a campaign on attitude and mindset change, then it doesn't matter. They cannot undermine each other because they will all be addressing these fundamental issues. Because without the right attitude, you cannot deliver any transformation agenda. Next point, building consensus on national strategy for growth. We have not had strategy. And without strategy, you are part of somebody else's strategy. Now, what the politicians do is to convert their manifestos into national strategy. And at best, it is four years or eight years. Then within that eight years, it has external shocks and then it is abandoned. So we have become part of somebody else's strategy. As a result of which, we fail to utilize our own resources and we cannot sustain our high growth. In fact, we once hit 14% GDP, but we were unable to sustain it because we had no sustainable strategy. It is important that each political party not, does not only give promises, but has a strategy which they are prepared to discuss with the opposition party regarding the strategy that is common to delivering the promises. The promises may be different, but the strategies can be aligned. It is like a hundred by four relay, and it is important that we coordinate. Unity. No kingdom ever rose when it was disunited. We were enslaved for disunity. We were colonized for disunity. I talked about that earlier. And we will continue not to progress if we remain divided. Any time a society is divided, it is dominated by others. Now, if there is nothing around which we can unite apart from the blasters, then when the blasters are not winning matches, there is nothing that unites us. I'm looking for manifestos to make proposals on how to unite the nation, including, for example, deciding that all political campaign banners should be removed after the election for at least two years, including having joint days, rallying around the flag days, etc., etc. Again, I believe that they have quite a lot of suggestions they can make, provided that their manifestos contain a section on unity. Incidentally, we come from a part of the world where our elders never get tired of telling us united we stand and divided we fall. It appears we have decided to fall. We also come from a part of the world where we have a proverb which says, if you want to go fast, go alone, and if you want to go far, go together. Definitely, we have decided not to go far because we are not united. The next point is a confident society. And confidence comes in two forms. Confidence in the society itself and self-confidence. We don't have a confident people. Even our politicians are not confident. If you see them talking to people that they go begging for money from, and you will see clearly that they lack confidence. When you lack confidence, you cannot deliver even your own program. Because somebody who doesn't understand your system will direct you to do that which will destroy your system. Political party manifestos must address the issue of how we drive confidence in the society and in the economy and among ourselves. In any event, it is important to understand that lack of confidence is one of the things which is contributing to the seventh problem that they need to address. Brain drain. The Nigerians call it Jakba. It was there in the 70s and 80s. It's become worse. Brain drain has really, really heightened. November, many, many people left to do care in the UK and the rest. And somebody must address that issue. Indeed, there's a new form of brain drain, which is where our IT experts are actually sitting here, but working outside. There is nothing wrong with it. The surprising thing is when they make innovative inventions, they have to register it in the likes of Delaware in order that they can raise capital. So even the money that we create from the innovation supports somebody else's economy and not our economy. To what extent 
we can stem the tide of brain drain in all its forms has to be a specific portion of the manifestos and I have not found this in any of the manifestos. Independence of Bank of Ghana. I can go on and on about that. Suffice to say that it should be clear in manifestos that the Bank of Ghana will be allowed to be very independent and the government will not go above its borrowing limits because clearly it is when it goes above the borrowing limits that we have inflation and we have all the kind of challenges that we do face. My only challenge with the central bank, and I've said this several times, that I think we need to hear more than inflation targeting. Now, I have no problems with inflation targeting per se, but clearly the number of things that cause problems of inflation and challenges of our economy goes beyond inflation targeting. And limiting our strategy to inflation targeting makes us design our economic strategies on the basis of an economy like an advanced country's economy. And I think we need to do more than that. And I, I mean, there are several things that we can do between Bank of Ghana and the, the, the central government if the manifesto addresses it regarding issues of scarcity, the scarcity mindset, the, the, the inadequacy of supply, etc., etc. These are multiplier things that we need to tackle. Widening the tax bracket. There must be a specific provision. This I found in a few of the manifestos, but they are not adequately addressed. There are two things that we need to do regarding widening the tax bracket and generating income. The first one is bringing in the informal and the, the many other people into the bracket instead of taxing people over and over. So I expect to see promises in manifesto which specifically goes to limit, putting a stop to taxing the same people more. Let me give an example. And I said this before, when E-Levy was being launched, that since everybody was now using Momo, or most people were using Momo, I thought the best thing we could have done was to have actually asked the banks to convert all Momo into bank accounts. And the reason why we should do that is simply because 16 million people vote, which means that more than the people above 18 are more than six, about 16 million. But only 5 million or less have bank accounts. So you have 11 million people who don't have bank accounts at, at all. So if you are using Momo and you converted all that into bank accounts, you immediately bring them into the economy and you have a financial deepening and, and inclusion. That way, for those who don't have tax, tax identification numbers, you can introduce a turnover tax for them. They are the ones who must pay e-levy. Because you don't have a tax identification number, every transaction through your book must have 5% turnover tax deducted. It forces people to get a tax identification number. Because if you have a tax identification number, you'll be paying your tax, and I don't have to deduct anything from. That way, we bring people into the tax bracket immediately. We can also find other ways of generating income, especially through SOEs, who have become a burden on government. And I am not in favor of privatizing SOEs, because if you do, the example shows that the SOEs we privatized did not become private, profitable in private hands either. I believe that government can do business, but it must do business as business. Ethiopian Airlines belongs to government and it makes a lot of profit because it's allowed to do business as business. But if the government keeps appointing bots who don't have the savviness to manage SOEs, SOEs become a burden on government. These are just two suggestions, but there are many of them that can be done in order to generate more income for government and then also widen the tax bracket. Cutting expenditure is another thing the manifestos must address. Because the expenditure, that takes us to IMF. I will just take a quick look at the current number of ministries. There are 23 of them. I will not list them for want of time. I have done a critical look, and I believe we can bring 23 down to 16, which is below the 19 number of cabinet ministers. And I will proceed to mention the 16 I recommend from 2024, and I will be happy to see manifestos don't say they will cut down the ministries or they will have X number of ministers. But talk about specifically where the ministries will be and which ministries are going away. We need to know what goes into the manifesto. Ministry of Defense, local government, rural industry, I will maintain. Foreign Affairs and Regional Cooperation, I will. Interior, I will. Justice and Attorney General, I will. Ministry of Food and Agriculture, yes. Finance, yes. Trade, I will change the name to Trade and Business Affairs. If giving, I mean, the minute the, 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 uh, I'm recommending to the, 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 the manifesto people, the reason is that the business aspect is actually not focused on. There was an attempt which was abandoned. Tourism should be maintained, environment, science, and technology. 
But the environment science and technology should take over some of the functions which are really part of environment. Like, for example, works and housing and uh, natural res uh, works and housing and um, uh, 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 water resources will be dropped because they are part of environment. Ministry of Energy, lands and natural resources, roads and transport instead of roads and highways, and Ministry of Transport and aviation and railways and all that. They are all transport. We are not big enough like India. With, in fact, India has a Ministry of Railways, but India has got tens of thousands of railway lines. At, at peak, we had only 963 kilometers of railway line, of which we have less than 100 kilometers left. You can't have a ministry for that alone. But we've been having this for more than 20 years. Education, youth, sports, I will add women and children affairs to it, health, and then employment and social welfare. Communications and the uh, uh, Ministry of Information will vanish because they can be subsumed under other ministries. And information uh, can be a presidential spokesperson. This will reduce the number of ministries to 16 and immediately cut government expenditure significantly. It's one of the things we ought to be looking at. So the manifesto should be telling us exactly how they will cut government expenditure. The other challenge has to do with the number of district assemblies, which has ballooned from 68. Under every government, it has been increased. We are now 275. It's a major problem that has to be addressed. There is no time for me to go into the details uh, on this. 11, how to deliver infrastructure without bloating public sector debt. Every government has delivered on infrastructure in one way or the other, and there is still a gap on infrastructure. But it is where public sector debt gets bloated. There have been talk about PPPs for long, how you can recourse to the private sector without necessarily having unnecessary recourse to government. It is important that strategies be presented by all political parties on how to get infrastructure that is, can be done by the private sector off government books without necessarily burdening the private sector or necessary recourse to the government sector. Again, if this is not addressed and you promise to deliver infrastructure, what you are indirectly saying is that you are going to increase the public sector pace. That's what it means. So some detail is very important. Stimulating economic growth must be a specific chapter. And this is not just an economic issue, but stimulating it. And there are multiple issues by which you can stimulate economic growth. Productivity to creating sector champions to encouraging consumerism. You can consciously encourage consumerism to drive demand, rewarding innovation, and using government actions as the basis to stimulate economic growth. Having a productivity drive, having things like changing from export protective zone to special economic zones, using our, the, the love for African clothing as a basis for driving um, a, 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 a consumption of our clothing sector. Health tourism. If you see the number of foreigners around West Africa who come to Ghana for medical assistance, we can consciously drive this. I can go on and on. At some point, 35% of all major universities in Ghana were attended by Nigerians and people from other West African countries. That number has dropped significantly. We could not have a strategy to actually stimulate the use of education as a basis of driving or, or stimulating the economy. Creating aggregators, creating special zones where people can buy without duty in order to drive it as part of tourism, especially when we are getting shopping malls here, so that they actually take the duty back just when they are leaving. And if you coordinate this, there are many, many ways that we can stimulate economic growth. Digital economy creates a complete opportunity. And again, there are many people who watch Netflix, use uh, Facebook and all the rest. I don't know to what extent they are being taxed. Maybe I've not paid too much attention to it. But digital economy itself has not been tapped into uh, fully. There is a politics of it, even though it has a very huge potential if we came together around it, and it can actually help us to leapfrog. 13, corruption, public procurement, and transparency. There's a lot that can be said. Uh, for want of time, I will move on. But it's important that manifestos have specific provisions on this, on how public procurement can be used to stimulate local investments, and in particular, how it can be made much more transpar trans transparent. Leveraging the AFCFT advantage. We all know that the ecosystem is changing. The headquarters is located here. However, it is my view that we are not leveraging it enough. I've had occasion to speak on several occasions on this. 
uh, probably during the discussion, uh, we can touch on it. But again, if the newsmen will be questioning politicians on this, what in their manifesto is going to deal with the AFCFTA and how? And if you look at look, take a look at the 2020 manifesto, you will notice that almost very little one-liner were said about that. Fifteen, how to punish ministers and public servants who fail the government. I don't know if sitting presidents know this until they leave power, but many ministers do not carry out the agenda of the sitting president. Many ministers carry out their own agenda and lie to the president in the face very often. This is very common, I mean, I, I, I mean uh, 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 throughout the period. But if a president monitors what his ministers are doing and is ready to punish them and hold them to it, he will not find one day that the people were not carrying out his agenda and what, what they were doing was different and that he was being told what is totally different from what is on the ground. So it is important that if you promise to deliver, then it is important that we know how you will deal with those who are supposed to deliver. Reducing wastefulness in the public sector. Again, I did not find this in any manifesto. 17, how to deliver infrastructure in an accelerated manner. Because a lot of the problem occurs as a result of delay in delivering it through various challenges, at times intra, intra party uh, 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 fights. Branding Ghana for tourism. I, I think since 2011, uh, many people know me of having led a fight or co led uh, the, the, the charge about branding Ghana as center of the world. Just because Ghana is situated five degrees above the equator. And on the last inhabitable land, when the, long, the, the longitude zero goes into the, the, uh, the sea. Incidentally, since 2017, I've seen an increase on the part of government to actually use it, but I do not think it's been used fully. One of the things that has not been done at all, despite efforts by private people like myself, uh, Kujia Kotobuati and the rest, who took it upon ourselves to engage GPHA and the rest, and insisted that the development of places like MPS in Tamahabo should have places for ecotourism where people will come to the center of the world and simply for religious tourism. In fact, there is a church, the church, Presbyterian Church in, 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 in Tema, sits on the zero degrees, where people, including the queen, have come to worship because of where it is located. The Africans who have these huge religious beliefs, if you, I cannot tell you the amount of religious tourism you can drive just from that center of the world. And I'm talking about religious tourism alone. I'm not, talking, I'm, not, I'm not talking about product brand, products made in the center of the world, etc., etc. Places that people can visit. Merchant Navy people performing ceremonies where they are in both the East and se- the Western semi- Hemisphere at the same time. I can go on and on and on. If you cannot brand a country from its location, then you can brand nothing. Yet this country borrowed almost $200 million for over 20 years to describe Ghana as a gateway. And I have said over and over, If God puts you at the center and you brand yourself as a gateway, there is something wrong up here you need to check. Manifestos must address our brand. Without our brand, we aren't going nowhere to call the Americans. 20, general business growth and specific regional champions. This has been said over and over again. A couple of manifestos mentioned it in person. We need to know how manifestos proposed to drive champions in every sector of the economy. And by regional champions, I mean creating businesses from Ghana, which becomes like the Dangotis. They don't happen by accident. They are consciously created. And they are not created from just taking one political party, a parachik, and turning him into a business person. He will fail. You take those who are already doing well, and you push them. And you don't have to take only one. You can take ten, one from the opposition party, and nine from your party, so far as they are doing well. So far as they are Ghanaian champions, that's the way to grow champions and you can create regional champions. You have an opportunity with the AFCFTA to do that. I would like to see detailed address of this and not one liner saying that we will create business champions. Next one, program to continue projects started by other parties. Each manifesto should indicate which projects they already know are ongoing that they will continue in the event they don't win or in the event they lose. So if as mentioned in your, uh, um, the cohort of the press, Mr. Chairman, when you, they come to your studio, ask them, will you continue existing projects? Which ones will you continue if you win? 
will you continue the next project if you lose when you come back that those questions should be asked interestingly in both manifestos i found something interesting they promised to continue the projects they would do when they they left power i don't know whether you understand what i'm saying yeah so because the dance government has stopped doing the projects and they promised to do the projects which were stopped but they are not promising to do the projects which those who stopped the yes are still doing the fact that somebody stopped yours doesn't mean you must stop the yes when are we going to have a situation where we promise to continue projects whether we started it or not at the end of the day they are projects so a program to continue those projects is specific and must be set out in the manifestos these are the things we worry about Consciously discouraging bad cultural habits. I've talked about uh, going to greet the president and telling them about chiefs. But one of them is paying queen mothers and chiefs and increasing their allowances. I think we have to put a stop to that. We should keep it at where it is. So far as I'm concerned, I don't think I want to be using taxpayers' money to be paying somebody just because royal blood goes through him. I think it's unfair to the taxpayer. And we have to say it as it is. I know politicians under pressure from the chiefs. I don't have any doubt about that. My duty as a technocrat is to make a presentation. It is possible nobody will ever hear this. And for the avoidance of doubt, I come from two royal families, both my mother and my father's side. So I'm conscious of, 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 of what royalty means. But it doesn't mean that when we stand at such a dangerous moment in terms of our ability to transform, we should be doing things just because we are royals. There's enough land and gold around the royalty for them to find their own money. Macroeconomic stability is a central issue, and we end up always trying to put pressure on the micro in order to stabilize the macro and come back. Provisions in the manifestos as to how macroeconomic stability will be attained without hurting the micro is an express thing that has to be provided. The rise and fall of global oil prices, because they always affect us, is another thing that must be tackled. Creating an energy hub. One of the things that the two parties have fought about is whether we have excess capacity of energy or not. Uh, it is a fact that energy prices, I mean, in terms of take or, uh, take or pay clauses, etc., due to the Dumso era, created challenges in terms of money that uh, the, the Ghana has to pay. And I'm talking about Ghana. It is also true that the distribution capacity of the energy we bought has challenges and therefore we have to pay for something we won't use. But I would have thought that it's an opportunity for us to create an energy hub. It is an opportunity for us to change the conversation from excess energy to creating an energy hub. Two, the price of energy for the for business sector is high. You cannot industrialize if energy is being sold at more than six cents per kilowatt hour which is what Ethiopia is doing now. So I expect a situation where the energy discussion in the manifestos will look at how to drop the price of energy to as close to 6 cents per kilowatt hour as possible. The same should go for dropping the cost of capital. It is these two things that will increase the cost of products and make us uncompetitive. So no matter how much energy you say you will stop doing so or not stop doing so, we don't have doom so now. The energy discussion should now move to how to make prices affordable to industry and also how to create a hub where we can export energy even under the AFCFTA. In other words, people will locate energy plants here and export it to the rest of West Africa and how to drive the West Africa power pool. That is the kind of provision I want to see in manifestos. Local content versus foreign content and the value chain development. There's a lot of push for local content. I think what is important is how we identify the value chain. We've had lithium and many of the so-called critical minerals are upstream. The current government is we're doing iron ore and bauxite and other things. But it is important that manifestos address how local persons actually are fitting into the value chain and how they are playing various roles. That is what creates wealth and reduces poverty. 27, tax limits on businesses. How do we hope to provision and put a limit on how much we tax businesses because without a margin, businesses cannot grow. Every promise to generate employment without limiting taxes on businesses is a promise that cannot be fulfilled because it's only when businesses have space that they are able to create employment. 
And I've made a recommendation before, which if the political parties want to take a look at, they may want to adopt in things like this. It's discriminatory tax. And it's very simple. Simply let those who don't retain employment or hire more pay a higher corporate tax. It's as simple as that. In other words, if the previous year a number of employees were the same, and you maintain them without firing anybody. And how do you know that? You simply check by social security contributions. If you paid social security from end to end and your PAYE from end to end for the same number of employees, then you have to pay 1% or 2% lower corporate tax. But if you are employing less, then your corporate tax should be higher. In other words, the more you employ, the lower, the lower the corporate tax. And you can drop it from 25 to 22 for those who are. That's the way to generate employment. There are approximately 35,000 private enterprises in this country who can create one employment on their own. That way, we do not need to create any national core of people seeking employment. And the rest can go to the public sector and also to encourage people who are creative. So, for example, those who have created innovative uh, 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 products who have registered in countries outside Ghana, if they set up a branch here, we should be able to incentivize them depending on the number of people they employ. The whole thing should be centered on the number of people they employ. And unless politicians do not understand, the more people get employment, the less they trouble you. It is people who don't have employment who have a lot of time to criticize you. Fail, um, uh, 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 um, fall and changes in commodity prices, export commodity prices, the likes of cocoa, etc. Again, a specific chapter to address that. Mr. Chairman, how do we look at these 28 or approximately 30 issues and how do we ensure that the manifesto pays attention to them? We should discuss this in our homes. We should discuss it in our WhatsApp platforms, in our churches, Facebook, etc. And this is not going to be a talk shop. I will make a copy of this available next week in terms of just the component of the list only as a guide to those who want, and I believe the organizers can share it to as many as possible. They are by no means sacrosanct ideas. You can add to it, deduct from it. But at least, if you address more than half of these issues, it is likely that we will have better manifestos that we, we have had. And for ordinary people, tell the manifesto writers that we are tired of just these 12 points that they all write the same thing. We want to see something new. And there are specific questions you can ask them. Have you taken this question into account? David delivered this lecture and asked question one, two, three. What is your answer to those questions? If you ask all these things, especially to the political party communicators and the Syria callers, if you ask them a few times in G, etc., etc., we will begin to come to the middle. And even though we will be talking about things in diverse ways, we will all be talking about things that will bring us to the center. For me, the last important we must address is a clear provision and manifesto in all this, apart from all this, on a sense of agency. How do we deliver everything that we have said in the manifesto with a sense of agency? Over the years, manifestos have been promised and they've been abandoned or delivered at the very last minute. That is the reason why governments promise to deliver things in four years and by the fourth year, they tell you that they have only done the foundation and they want another four years to do the roof. The, I will explain to you, and, and I will be ending on that point, the problem that politicians face as a result of that. Because all the manifestos lack an action list. An action list which is precise as to what it will deliver, when, with a sense of agency. In 2024, we stand at the threshold of a lot of promises which has to be made, which is going to overlook the reality we face. And if we all don't rally to ensure that they stick to a guide of the promises they make, they will make these promises and overspend and take us to back to where we want to turn from. And by they, I mean politicians, not a specific political party. So yes, we are in a challenge. But yes, I'm optimistic because we have a chance to transform. When things are really bad, it is actually an opportunity to transform and it arises when we take actions in a concerted manner with a sense of agency. And I'll make that point I said I would make earlier. There is one basic thing politicians forget. They forget that four years is 48 months. So they spend the first one year 
celebrating and teasing the opponent when they win power. And when you point out that they are delayed, they tell you we have just one power. Give us time. By the time two years is gone, it's left with 12 months, then everything must be done in a hurry. And as they hurry, they make mistakes. And if they lose power, the next government can stop project and investigate it all over again. So a journey which can take 40 years like China did to transform from a third world country to where it is today is taking us more than 60 years and we haven't even begun. It is important that those of us who don't intend to ever go into politics continue talking and making contributions, suggestions as to what they should do, and constantly question them and bring them to the middle and not be part of the divisive conversation. And on that note, Mr. Chairman, I believe that there is hope and that if we do these things, we can actually have a common manifesto that will take us to a common future. Thank you. Hello? A big round of applause for him. David will take his seat. And I'm not going to invite quickly my uh, panelists to join me. They're not going to have a conversation. I mean, he's given us a lot to chew on. We're going to be challenging him on a few things, but also beginning to, I guess, flesh it out a bit. And we've also been joined by the Deputy General Secretary of the MPP is with us, um, uh, Mohammed Haruna, you join us, uh, joining us. Thank you very much for coming. Yes, great. The Deputy General Secretary is also here. And uh, thank, thankfully, the two secretariats are represented, I mean, the two main parties. And so, I mean, uh, David will have an opportunity. Uh, he hasn't got, he has a soft copy, so we can start with that before the hard copy comes in. But I want to quickly invite to join me right now, Michael Koto. Hello, Michael. Michael, please, please join me. Please, a round of applause for him. And Michael is a management consultant, policy expert, and strategist with 15 plus years experience working for and advising local corporate, multinationals, international development institutions, global charities, and governments. He's a managing partner at an international advisory firm, Confidence, headquartered here in Accra, where he oversees a network of 60 plus African region focused consultants, analysts, scholars providing client delivery across multiple. Uh, geographics and sectors. Now, he has been a consultant to global and regional institutional uh, bodies like the World Bank, IMF, there's a whole list of them indeed. And Koto has led the uh, pioneering of Africa region industry benchmarking tools and studies. And I'm delighted that he can join us. He is one of the lead architects of the trillion dollar investment and financing framework for implementation of the Africa continental free trade area, uh, which was adopted by the summit of Africa Union heads of state in 2020. And so uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, for this conversation. He's taken his seat. Also joining us is a, is a woman who you may have heard about. And as uh, David talked about mindset change, etc., her name keeps resonating. Um, she is the alumna of the London prestigious Imperial College Business School, a barrister at law, a member of the Middle Temple Inn of Court, who is currently pursuing PhD studies in entrepreneurship, and she has had a strategic change management consultancy and mindset coaching practice for over two decades in the UK. She seeks to transform the mindset of Africans everywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me with a round of applause. Welcome, uh, Akosi Abame. And I want to start with Akosia straight up. Akosia, so give me, your, give me your thoughts on what you've just heard there. And, and we've been alerted that, uh, you know, yes, we've slightly done, like, you know, 45 minutes. Uh, what we are currently doing, what, well, in terms of timing, we are uh, 20 past 8. We still will end exactly at 9, no matter what happens. And I want to engage my audience as well. So, Akosia, you have the challenge of navigating this, this time slot that we have. But I know you can do it. Let, let me hear your thoughts on what we just said. Well, um, thank you, David. Uh, a lot to think about, I would say. I'm not totally... Well, actually, what comes as a surprise to me is if we've had so much left out of these manifestos, why are we not even in an even worse mess? Because everything you said, I mean, I'm not going to disagree with the things that you've highlighted that should be going into the common manifestos, but essentially we've had parties' priorities 
uh, become national priorities that do not address anything. I mean, that is, so we are even lucky to be where we are. I do agree with the common themes. I think we will need to um, maybe enunciate a bit more about the process of actually getting to the common themes. I was so pleased to hear you talk about national mindset change. I talk about national mindset revolution because, I mean, change can come in evolution and it can come in revolution. Evolution has taken us nowhere, so we need revolution. Particularly, I mean, one of the things that comes out in when you are talking about our national attitudes and the national mindset and not going to the IMF 17 times, one of the things that came out to me was the fact that we have a dependency mindset that actually permeates even our economic policies. Because if we, rec well, I mean, I will quote uh, Osajifu, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, when he says, the best way of learning to become an independent sovereign state is to be an independent sovereign state. But it looks like we have actually created this backstop dependency within our economic policies that says, well, if all else fails, we'll just go to the IMF for a bailout and hopefully it will be the last time we go. So at a national level, even within our economics, we have a dependency mindset. And then obviously at a citizen's level as well, we have a dependency mindset. You've also talked about the leadership. That, and I mean, there's always a saying that leadership, the, the people get the leaders they deserve. And so far, we've got the leaders we deserve because we've not been seeking accountability for them. We don't see our leaders as servants. So again, one of the things that I think should come through the national mindset chain is a national expectation of our leaders that they should be seen as servants and they should actually have legacy mindsets themselves. We should have an expectation of legacies from our leaders. The one thing I wanted to talk about or really highlight here, you mentioned the fact that our contributions are important. The key thing for me is what is the process of getting our contributions? Because the actual process of getting our contributions is also a way of changing the mindset. It actually tells the ordinary citizen their voice matters. And so we need to, again, think about some of these channels, you know, what are our district commissions doing? How do we use our chiefs? We should use even wherever people gather. So we can use our churches, we can use our mosques, wherever people gather, universities, institutions, somehow, somehow, how, we need to get the voices of the people determining the common themes. Otherwise, we risk repeating exactly what has happened before by coming together here and coming up with the common themes and imposing it through the manifestos, we have, in a way, ignored the voices of the people. So a lot of food for thought there, and I will leave it there now so that um, Michael can also give his thoughts. But, yeah, yeah. Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we should give another round of applause uh, for David. Um, I, David is one of those people I can listen to for hours and not be bored. Uh, he will overstimulate you, and that's exactly what he's done today. Uh, very original uh, ideas. Um, my only problem with David is he always says he's never getting into politics or public service. Um, if he has all these brilliant ideas and he keeps talking about them, and I believe that there's, there's a place for public intellectuals like himself, and the, the platform that we have here set, you know, serves to contribute to that purpose to get professionals to, 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 to participate in the national debate. But there is a point beyond which talk and debate um, cannot get you the results. Uh, and so, uh, David, I think that this is, a, this is an issue that you and I have talked about time and again. I know that you, you will rebuff it, but if the opportunity ever presents itself, we would all here be very, 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 very delighted to see you uh, enter public service and contribute uh, to, 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 to see some of these ideas implemented. I love everything David said, but I'm going to disagree with him on one fundamental point. And perhaps he was trying to be very pragmatic with this lecture. Election year is upcoming, and 
he, what he has done is very important, which is to, the parties are now in the process of putting their manifestos together. So he's being very practical. How do we get the parties to focus on what is really important? But I don't have to be pragmatic <laughs> for the sake of the upcoming election year. So I'm going to be as, as free as I can to say what I want to say which is that the only way we can have a common manifesto for our common future is to ban party manifestos. Let's ban them. I hear time and again a lot of Ghanaians frustrated about why we cannot have a national development plan and stick to it. We keep referring to Malaysia, we keep referring to Singapore, we keep referring to, to, to the Chinese. And we know that this has been a very fundamental part yeah, that's right. of their transformation. There's no way we can have a common national development plan and stick to it if we keep having party manifestos. It's not possible. There's a contradiction there. So if we want a common manifesto that will translate into a common development plan, I say ban the party manifestos. And that raises a fundamental question. If you ban the party manifestos, what are the parties going to compete over? The liberal democratic dispensation that we have says it's a contest of ideas. So let the best ideas compete and let them win. And that is why every year we do, every four years we do elections, supposedly to elect the best ideas. But I don't think that's the most important thing. The most important thing, and David has alluded to some of them, is that we need consensus. And the stories of the Asian tigers that we admire so much keeps pointing to this issue. So I say, in order to have a common national manifesto, let's ban the party manifestos. Now, if they don't have manifestos, what do they compete over? I say, let them compete over who is the best at achieving what I call the national KPIs, the key performance indicators, which is what we don't have. So the situation we have now is like, you've employed people, but you don't give them KPIs. And you don't have any mechanism for measuring these key performance indicators by which you decide whether to retain them or to promote them or to sack them. So the employees are the ones who approach you and tell you that this is what I want to do for you. And you, the employer, says, okay, have the job. No KPIs, they set their own KPIs. At the end of the four years, the employee comes back to you and says, I've done very well, retain me. There is no regress mechanism for determining whether they have really executed well or not, and they repeat the promises. This is a fundamental flaw. Yeah. Now, the Constitution is not going to necessarily accommodate the things I'm saying here, and that's why I said I'm not being as pragmatic as you need me to be. But what I want to do is to, is to push certain debates. And if ever, I mean, now we're talking of a possible constitutional review. If that happens, maybe, right, we could see how this happens. If we can have national KPIs, the question then is, how do you ensure that the parties keep to executing the national KPIs? And every four years, you can hold them accountable. I have a simple idea we should agree on some non-negotiables in this common manifesto, national common manifesto, which is binding because it's not the parties that are proposing it, but we have proposed it as a country. And it's not just a manifesto, we have the KPIs. And we automate how we count the results. Some of what you guys are doing are joy, which is to try to do that. We do that as a country. But this is what we do. If you don't meet the targets as an administration, as a government, you accumulate scores which we will convert into points that we deduct from whatever vote you get in the next election. <laughs> so if you get 50% and you don't meet the target, we have a formula. If we're deducting 10%, we, we deduct 10% 10 from, the from, from the vote you've got. So <laughs> it comes down. 40%. I don't want us to reward them because that's what we've paid them to do. So if we are not deducting, we are by definition rewarding you.
But we need a system very rigorous. That is very punitive. All the behavioral science that, that's been done shows that human beings respond better to cost incentives than to benefit incentives. That's, the way I'm, that's why I'm framing it like this. So, just to summarize, let's ban party manifestos. Let's have a common national manifesto. And we can have a discussion about how that comes up. Imagine if the 1992 constitution is something we had to do with the parties coming up with their own constitutions and then, you know, that's... No, we were able to do a consultative national assembly and we co-authored a constitution that we have kept to for over 30 years. Imagine if the same 30 years period we had been able to keep to a common national development plan just as we have kept to the 1992 constitution. So if we could co-author a common constitution, we can co-author a common national development plan so that the parties don't come to make promises. We decide what is priority. The priorities are converted into very, very measurable, rigorous, key performance indicators. You compete on the basis of the team that you put together. Because when you're looking for a job, you go applying for a job, it's the competencies that you advertise. You don't go making promises to the potential employer. So let our parties compete on the basis of the talent they can put together. Let them demonstrate ideas about how they can achieve those KPIs. But they don't come making new promises. No. And then we hold you accountable by having this point deduction system. If you don't meet the targets, we deduct it from whatever mm. you, you get. So um, this will be my opening uh, statement. Good opening. And uh, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to do something. <laughs> If you want the party manifestos ban, show by hand. <laughs> hmm. That's it. That's a majority of the room here. I mean, if you're on television, if you want the party manifestos ban, please show by hand. Show by hand. <laughs> ban. Yes, ban. Okay. That's, 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 that's a majority of the room. I just, and I see the politicians feel uncomfortable. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll, I'll come to you pretty shortly. But, but of course, I want to come back to you. Mm -hmm. I think the point that he's addressing is coming to the issue about how do you mandate what he was talking about? Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. His solution is to ban it. And then have this one that everybody else plays by. Come and tell us how you deliver on the KPI. What, 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 how do you mandate it? How do you, do you mandate, mandate um, the, the, common the manifesto. common manifesto that he well, proposed? Well, this, this is a big question and hence where Michael is going. Yeah. We're caught between a rock and a hard place at the moment because we're caught in short term trying to fix something now in terms of the 2024 elections, as well as the long-term view. But if I were to even take Michael's discussion to its logical conclusion, I would start talking about what is, why do we even have party politics as our governance model in the first place? So I'm not going to even go there yet. But that is a fact. I would be going to ban multi-party politics as a mechanism of democracy in this country. It's not working now, and it's never going to work because it's not based on ideology differences is based on tribal divide but let's park that conversation so the issue that you raised though is very crucial because I mean David in his exposition basically said well you can't mandate good behavior and he's, he is right which then means that re regardless of whatever themes common themes we place in these party manifestos without it becoming a national mandate it just becomes another series of promises that they can renege on. That raises a question of how do we hold these people accountable? From a legal perspective, I would love to turn the manifesto into a legally enforceable document. How pragmatic and practical that is, I don't know. The truth of the matter is it doesn't lend itself to any straightforward answer. But at least if we galvanize citizens in the process of defining whatever goes into those manifestos, whereby they truly understand, not based on some slogans that are told to them during party campaigns, but actually the import of what has been discussed and is being promised. And if we then, within the manifestos, also have a defined mechanism of accountability, interim, because again, I heard Michael talk about four years. Mm -hmm. We don't have to wait four years for a failing government to then f vote them out of power for another failing government to come and repeat the four-year cycle. There has to be an interim mechanism of them 
being held to account. But the issue then becomes, really, even if we give them the opportunity to account to us and they are failing, how do we punish them Mm. in the interim? This is where we, what we are missing. And that is why there's a lack of accountability. I personally describe our current mechanism of democracy as sanctioned dictatorship for four-year cycles. Because we vote you into power, you come into power, you do whatever the hell you want for four years, maybe just before the fourth, the fourth year, you come and bribe us with some chicken and rice and Fanta and Coke or whatever it is you, you care to bribe us with. Idiots that we are, we vote you into power again. And this is what we've had over the past, what, 30 years. So something, this is why I say the governance model fundamentally needs to be looked at. So I can't really truly give you one answer that says this is how we're going to get these people to be accountable. Mm. I actually even was lit interested in listening to David because David was very careful in his use of words. He kept saying promises. And I, yes, I, I kept saying to myself, well, another promise to be broken. Um, Yao, my friend, will say miracles that will go nowhere. <laughs> this is the issue. How do we get to hold party politics to account whilst obviously we start a bigger conversation beyond just the national development program plan, whatever we want to call it, the blueprint for Ghana, where we want to see Ghana 50 to 100 years from now, all of that. Mm. We need a proper governance model that allows accountability. Mm. I would say what we currently have does not. David, and I'll come to the audience, starting with the political reps. Ivan, let's be very careful here. And uh, I'm happy Michael said he doesn't want to be pragmatic. <laughs> I'm, I'm a pragmatist. We are in, December, we are in uh, November. Friday, we are in December. Either way, we are going to have elections next year. Yeah. We don't have to, I mean, yeah. the people who ban manifesto are the people who won't ban manifesto. Mm-hmm. They are the ones in power. None of the, there are two deputy general secretaries here. None of them are going to ban manifesto. <laughs> the constitution, the way it is structured, you cannot review the constitution until you go through the processes. It's a long process of referendum, etc. So I don't do things which are not practical. I mean, given the chance, we will have just a China type of government, like mm-hmm. Akosia, and then we will ban manifesto. <laughs> but that's not practical. So these two parties will introduce manifesto. <laughs> now, I want to address the question about national agenda. We do have one. Mm-hmm. There are some things that we, we have a national agenda, and there are people who keep saying, Ghana has had vision, let's, leaders who don't have vision, I disagree. Every leader in Ghana has had a vision. They have abandoned the vision. They abandoned the vision when they face the reality of external shocks, etc. Those are the issues that we are talking about. So everyone, and I can go from vision 2020 to current date, we all, they come with a vision. And the vision has spelled out the manifesto. Why is the vision not posted in the constitution? Because during the consultative assembly, we made what, when you look back, is now a clear mistake to create a national development planning commission, thinking that it was going to be a strong institution to create this national agenda. That's what the Constitutive Assembly did. And we passed at uh, 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 179 and 180 with the view uh, uh, that these two acts are going to drive the, the creation of a national development agenda. Okay. Now, 579 and 580, sorry. Now, when the National Development Agenda is being drafted, and in fact, under the current government, one was drafted by the NDPC and handed over to the president. The previous ones, every government has done, even under Kufosa, and there was Agenda 2045. Yeah. Everyone has done, and you look at the, how it is developed. It is developed from the district assembly. Each of them has a district development plan. They go to the regional coordinating council. They have a regional development plan. It is backed by a national special plan under Act 925, until you have a national development plan. So we do have one existing. But the, the NDPC has no ministry. So there is no representative of the NDPC in parliament. I was careful in drawing, look at the practical things. NDC has no representative in parliament. There's no committee in parliament that oversees the NDPC until we turn it into a ministry. Because the parliamentary select committee is either created to mimic the government ministry or as a standing committee. Mm. And that's the conundrum we have. So every single national development plan becomes useless. It's put aside. What the parties do is to say, 
I have a mandate. I have gone for election and I have a mandate to deliver. Yeah. Where is that mandate? That mandate is in the manifesto. You have one of two choices. Go to the stream and burn a manifesto. None of us in this room has that power. And we don't have that time. We are going to 2024 where they will make more promises and take us to 2025. If we go for the escapism, which is burn manifesto or the escapism of blame the constitution and explain it and therefore let us revise the constitution as we review the constitution we are thinking they made a mistake because of the constitution i want to repeat no law is so good as to prevent a good person from a bad person from doing something which is good mm. and no law is so bad that if a good person wants to do that which is good he will not do so how do we drive it i gave the answer it's very simple drive what goes into the manifesto because that is what they are coming to ask for election don't leave it for them to derive the promises. Drive what goes into it. Question it. Question them and channel their minds to that which is uniform so that in the imperfect situation, you have something as close to what you like as possible. What do we all talk about on our, our platforms? Meritocracy. Politicization of, of, of every single issue. Everything I have listed in the 29 points are the things we talk about. But these are the things which are absent from the manifestos. The problem is what is not in the manifesto. So mm. instead of waiting to burn it, let us drive what goes into it. Whilst we take time to burn it. Okay. I want to now, I have 15 minutes. Um, I'm going to take 10 minutes of audience interaction and then, you know, use the right to. I'm going to go into the audience. Please, do you have a microphone? And a microphone very quickly. And I want to quickly hear, great. I want to quickly hear from the Deputy General Secretary of the NDC, and I'll hear the Deputy General Secretary of the MPP, and then I'll let all of you uh, join the conversation. Ask questions. I mean, ask questions. Um, Nana de Malibu, I'm, I'm sure you have some thoughts. You don't have one? Uh, whilst you're bringing the microphone, please let me hear from the NDC first. I have my own one quick addition to the suggestion to ban a manifesto. What if, we have the NDPC already, what if we mandate the parties to submit their manifestos, make the NDPC the approving authority of manifestos? So you have the fundamental policy blueprint that they've developed, which is a national development plan that we talked about. And then before your campaign starts, submit your manifesto to the NDPC, and then they would vet it and approve if it meets the KPIs, let me borrow your term, as the NDPC are so determined. So everybody else comes, you play within the framework, and you bring your, your manifesto, and the NDPC will look at it and improve and see whether it meets the national development agenda. That's just one. We are all thinking around the subject. Let me hear you. You, you support money manifestos? Thank you very much and uh, good evening to our audience. First of all, I think this is a very stimulating conversation intellectually. That, by the way, is Mustafa Bandi. Mustafa, I, introduce I, yourself. I, I so seem to enjoy yourself. what he presented. And I would like to request for the video. I'll play it over and over again just to understand the context intellectually from where he's coming from. I must say that apart from being a politician and my colleague from the other party is an intellectual, he's a doctor as well. So we are not just politicians. So I'm trying to define politics from intellectual perspective and politics from the real life. When you get into office as a politician, you realize that any day, any time, we need manifestos. But what society should be conscious about is the will and character of the politician. The ability of the politician to walk the talk, to actually be seen doing what the politician is saying. Now, the biggest challenge in our society, which is an injustice, is having to have a sleeping society. A society that is not vigilant enough to rise up against the ills. A society that tolerates what is wrong. A society that contains and tolerates what is affecting the same society. I believe that Ghana should become an active society that is willing to rise up and speak against the ills of politi political parties. Manufacturers are very important. Now, today we have a system where a government comes and tells you, I'll build one village, one dam, for example. This is a very brilliant policy that would have helped our society, but society refused to ask, what will the dams be used for? The policy did not accompany the use of the dams. Ghanaian society didn't ask for it. You didn't ask generic 
one village, one dam. What about western region, where they don't need a dam? What about eastern region, where a dam is not needed? Can you construct a dam on the Kwau mountain? What is it going to be used for? So society should critique what politicians present up to the north and see what these dams will be used for. And let me conclude. President Mahama says, I'm coming into government, I'm bringing Ghanaians fundamentally to tackle unemployment, job creation and living condition, I'm bringing a 24-hour economy. We would want to have debates, we would want to have a society willing to critique a 24-hour economy, we want to have people intellectually sitting down to talk about the feasibility of a 24-hour economy. Instead of us preaching against manifestos, comparing a party in government and a party in a position and taking their manifestos does not solve the problem. The problem is that we should take a political party in government's manifesto and look at what the government is actually doing. A very quick question before I go to them. And people, you've, you've seen and heard the uh, Fusidote's prescription of what the manifesto should address. Yes. Your party is currently in the process, I believe, of finalizing your manifesto. Correct. You've had them. Are these stuff that you're thinking about already? And which of these will, you, will be incorporated into your manifesto? Yes, for example, there are no negotiables in every manifesto. If you look at the two manifestos, and here I've pretty compared the two of it, which I'll read and review later. Now, if you look at the components of political parties' manifesto, you cannot draft a manifesto without talking about health. You cannot draft a manifesto without talking about employment. You cannot draft a manifesto without talking about agriculture. But the difference lies in the ideology, the way a political party would tackle this. When a government says, I will strengthen the Auditor General, but has least tolerance to criticisms of the Auditor General, leaves much to be desired. And we have to be talking about this. Do my, do my level is partly a victim of this situation, where a government says, I was trending the Auditor General, but comes into power and removes I'm an Auditor General for criticizing it. What is going to change on your 2024 manifesto? Because what, what is David going said to apply change to you? Yes. is that NDC comes to power to tackle unemployment, which is fundamentally our problem. Two, NDC comes to power to deal with corruption. And Ghanaians must support the NDC's commitment to deal with corruption. Corruption is not when you you know, look at one minister and take him to a court because he is not your political okay. party. We should have mechanisms okay. that tackle collapse, corruption holistically. Okay. Okay. You know? Thank you. I'll, so that's I'll, what it's going to change. I'll get my power to give you a very, at least they're beginning to hear a few things. Uh, yes. Haruna Mohammed, your thoughts on what you've uh, heard tonight and how the MPP is incorporating it into your next manifesto. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Evans. I'm very happy to be here uh, to participate in this very intellectual discussion. Uh, when I was first invited to come for this program, I was asking myself, citizen manifesto, who gives power? The citizen gives power. The citizen is gathering to discuss manifesto. And it is very essential in government delivery. And as a politician and a technocrat, I believe that we can achieve this when all of us, I mean every citizen of Ghana, thinks about Ghana first. And that is the ideal thing that all of us would have to look at. Listening to the presentation that was made by uh, David, David. I picked a number of things from it, and me representing the New Patriotic Party here is to send these key points to my party as we gear towards uh, political activities into the 2024 elections. And I can pick few notes from it that parts of it, we have picked some of them in terms of digitalizing the economy in terms of delivery on infrastructure, in terms of uh, looking at some of the soft aspects that he has mentioned in the 30 
uh, 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 key points, which is not structured based on what my colleague was talking about in terms of health, in terms of education, in terms of uh, social policy and what have you. But all the 30 points has a place in terms of any of the sectors that any politician will be developing activities on. So as much as we do this, for me, the question to whether we should ban manifesto or not, uh, clearly I go with what David was saying, because in his delivery, we talked about whether manifesto was a social contract, and he quoted uh, 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 a case that seeks to say that it is not a contract, but it is somehow, some way being measured in parliament because if a promise is made in a particular sector, policies and programs are developed and sent to parliament for discussion and implementation. So instead of us looking at banning manifestos, why not, as we said, the discussion has triggered, let's feed into what the manifestos or the politicians will develop and force these things to be a contractual agreement with the people in terms of strengthening um, National Development Planning Commission, as he mentioned, because... I'll the question then on how do you, what are the channels you will use next year to gather the contributions? So you're saying contribute to your manifesto, everybody should. So what are the has, channels you're going to use to get all of us in this room and beyond it's going to, to be, contribute to your manifesto? It's going to be participatory. How? Participatory in the sense that um, what we have to do is using one of this forum. My participation in this forum has brought out a number of issues. These issues are going to be one of the contributing factors. We will be able to do some aspects of what we call the town hall meetings. Uh, engage and have their best. In terms of uh, looking at uh, the private sector, and then also industry players, you are able to engage them, take their point, go down to the citizens and make sure that we get their point and take advantage of these platforms Okay. That will bring out issues that we don't know. Because if you look at Johari's windows, you have your blind side, you have your known side, and you have your unknown side. So if you are stick to one, you wouldn't be able to identify what the people need. Okay. And I think that the MPP is going to open up and make sure that at least we join the citizens hmm. to ensure that we get what will be able to do for okay, them because we you. have not said that we have brought heaven to the people of Ghana. Thank you very much. But we have demonstrated that courage thank to you. ensure that we live with the thank people you much, and implement thank you what the people much. will like. Um, are there any questions in the audience? I have just five minutes, so I'm going to take three and then come and wrap up. So I wanted to take one from here, one from, one from here. And Okay, you have the microphone already, so you can go. I'll take you and I'll take... Uh, is there a lady? Is there... Yes. I'm sorry, I'll take, I'll take the lady right after you. And, yeah. and, and I, strictly, one strictly. minute. Okay, one I have minute. four minutes, yes, one minute. I have four minutes, I'll take you, I'll take him, so three minutes and all, and then I'll come back. All right, that's up. okay. Go. Uh, my name is Godwin. Yeah. Um, I have three questions, actually. Oh, just one. <laughs> because I have strictly three minutes, you have one of the three. <sighs> so one, let's go. I just want to ask Mr. Tatter. Please, microphone. I want to ask Mr. Tatter that if I give him... 10 Chinese babies to make a fancy a gun, an auza, a moshi out of it, out of them. How would they handle it? Okay. 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 You see, you, I agree you, with Mr. Dante. Can you repeat the question? If I give him 10 Chinese babies to make a fancy a gun, an auza, all right, out of a tribe, Ghanaian tribe, out of this fancy uh, Chinese babies, how would he go about it? Okay, you, you want to provide the point is? Exactly. So the point is, I agree with him, everything. I love listening to him. Okay, but the cause of our problem is what we lack in here. What is the cause? Okay, we talk of manifesto. Manifestos are aspirations, just like national development plan. But what makes the bridge between aspirations and accomplishment is discipline. And that is what we lack in this Okay. Society. And, and I the think contest, that was one of the key things. That's contest, one of the key things The contest about, yeah. in which we place our public officials to operate for us 
It's totally bad. Okay, great. We so are all the one minute, the one one, minute is up. We are all professionals here. One minute is How up. How many of us will entrust our resources, our enterprises mm. to others for the same people to self-regulate it Yeah. And expect them to live up to expectations. Great. I, I want to take, take him. Yes. Please, your name very quickly. Also have a minute and I'll take... <coughs> Mo? Yes. Uh, basically, there's one thing which uh, is, is lacking in our political system, and that is love of country. Okay. There's no love of country, and basically our leaders have got this Pashoko type of mindset <laughs> where they only think about self and party. Mm. So the question is that, why do we reward our political leaders when they go out of power for messing our economy up. You mean the ex Russia? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Unfortunately, time, and I'll okay. take the last one there, another minute, and I'll wrap up. Yes. Please. Hi. My name is Rita Aban, and my view, listen to everyone, was to suggest political parties have their manifesto. In the first six months in parliament, why don't they get the parliamentarians to consolidate and come up with a governing manifesto? Okay. NDPC will then have more of a prominent role coming up with the KPIs. But then how can you control them in terms of monitoring? Because there's also a cost to maintaining democracy. Okay. Is it possible to have midterm assessment of parliamentarians? Because then at a district level, they assess you better in terms of your governing manifesto. Okay. So after two years, if you're not performing, you. we don't wait for four Thank years. You. Thank we you very you much. Out. Thank you very much. Now I have three minutes, because I, I need to still end before eight, and then they'll, they'll take us off, and I don't want to end abruptly. So I'm gonna give you first, Michael, you have a minute. <laughs> so um, what the lady just said is probably the, the, the most pragmatic way um, of enforcing many of the brilliant ideas, you know, that we just spoke about. We need to find a way to ensure that the best ideas in both manifestos get implemented by whoever wins the election. Right? That's very important. So there, there, there needs to be a mechanism for consolidating and converting them into KPIs and finding a way to hold them accountable. So I like that idea. The other issue, and, and uh, the gentleman here talked about, now I think there's a lot of seconds. apathy there's a lot of apathy among citizens. A lot of it is frustration and hopelessness. And I would really love to hear David's own thoughts on how we can stimulate more uh, engaged citizens okay. uh, throughout the electoral process, not just when we have to vote at the, at the, the electoral process. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I agree, sir. Well, I mean, listening to everything, in my opinion, this story came to mind very quickly. The six uh, blind men with the elephant. And each is touching a different part of the elephant and saying, oh, the elephant feels like a wall. Oh, the elephant feels like a snake. It feels like a spear. That's what we've had over the past, the, the fourth republic. Every party comes in and decides that I'm going to build a wall. I'm going to build a spear. I'm going to build a rope. And they all don't come together to actually solve the elephant problems. So yes, at this point, we may not have the ideal solution in terms of being able to legally enforce manifestos, but the best at least we can do is to start with a common, the common themes in a common manifesto. It is not a nice to have, it's imperative. Mm, absolutely, and, and David, you get a final word. I think, uh, uh, and I think picking from what the response of the Deputy General Secretary of NDC was, uh, I hope he didn't misunderstand it about the 12 points which is common to all of them. You can't have a manifesto that doesn't talk about health, infrastructure, etc. Those 12 points are, what I'm talking about are the things without which the 12 is irrelevant. And like I said, no, there cannot be a nation with security, which both of them deal with, when there is indiscipline. And therefore, if the manifesto doesn't have a section on how to instill in discipline, or discipline, we are, we are failing. Similarly, if you talk about Anything, infrastructure, they all talk about it. How do you deliver it without bloating public sector debt? That's the issue, because mm. that's what will take us to IMF. So for me, the issue is simple. I will circulate these approximately 30 points. Yeah. Question them as to how each of the manifesto addresses these things. Yeah. 
whether in future we ban manifesto or not, we need to be having a conversation that addresses the most important Cotton things thing. that are missing from the And at least they all say they want to take your word for it. Oh, yes. So, yeah, so yes. we'll give it to them. They will have a Th- Thank you all for joining us both here at the British Council and those watching and listening to us across the world. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And I take one word, mindset. Mindset change is a thing that starts it all. Let's all go and think about that. Enjoy the rest of your evening.